soul. And the more, you, sorry, the more you have this care and you're saying, I'm choosing to not do this or do this so I can feel more the intensity of the energy of the holiday, for sure it's going to help you feel more the intensity of the energy of the holiday. So you're saying which which humor to take on. I think that's more like you have to look yourself and say, you know, what you are doing, what you haven't done until now, you know. I mean, there are limitless so, humor so with Pesach. Right. So I, I'm going away, like I don't because I don't make my own Pesach, I kind of want to like, and I go away. I'm I'm basically at the mercy of wherever they are, you know, like wherever, whatever they do. But I was thinking just personally, just to like not have every pace off roll into each other and like to break up the monotony of just like another one let's get through it kind of thing just like a personal something to kind of like make it mean a little more than just going to someone's house and having a seder with them and you know so maybe what you could take on because i understand what you're saying you're going somewhere so you're going to eat whatever they serve is in the realm of the optional let's call it desserts and snacks not the, the actual meal itself, but in desserts and snacks, you're going to choose to only use from certain hechsherim or, and if it's, and if you can't find out with hechsherim, you won't eat it. And if it's not from that level of hechsherim, you won't eat it because you want to practice more care. So you're not going to be, start questioning how they made their potato kogel or their chicken soup. But once it comes to a dessert or a snack, you, you can choose. Nobody's going to wonder if you don't eat it. It's not going to in, insult anyone. It's not, not going to impinge on your ability to enjoy the yantiv. And you could say, I'm holding back because it's pace. And I want to be careful. And I don't know if it's what I decided to use or not. And I'm not going to ask. So I'm just not going to have until I can snoop a little around the kitchen and find out. Is there like something behind the restriction of it? Is that the idea? Or like, well, you're saying for what? Like what I just suggested to you? Well, yeah, like for what you that any, I, any major hechsher, any major product, there's far more leniencies done than in someone's kitchen who's careful. Because once you're processing, there's the idea of hefseb meruba, very great loss. There's a lot more. No, again, some hechsher room are much more careful than lots of people's kitchens. <laughs> it depends which hechsher and which kitchen you're comparing it to. But just once you get into the realm of hechsherim or of more precisely processed items, you don't know how many leniencies went together to say this is okay. And again, it's not necessarily wrong, that perspective. Just like, um, I'll just say this briefly because I'm really going to into what we're talking about tonight, but um, the OU, okay, we're not talking about pissing, I'm talking about just in general. The OU has a philosophy. It's a very admirable philosophy. They want... That anywhere, let's say at least in America, anybody can eat. You know, you could be in any little hick town in America and there should be enough items on the shelf with an OU that you can eat. So what they're doing is they're making kosher food mass accessible, which helps many, many people keep kosher. The downside of that is to be able to do that they often have to rely on many leniencies. Now, the OU is very transparent. Every single leniency they rely on is right there on their website. They're very transparent about everything they do, which is beautiful. And everything they do is with rabbinic permission, which is beautiful. But they're definitely going to use leniencies because that's the only way you can get all these foods to be kosher. So why do they have to make all these foods kosher? Because there are some people that will say, I want to keep kosher, but I'm not going to give up product X. And if I can't get it kosher, I'll get it not kosher. What's the big deal anyway? No, 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 no. We want you to get every single product that you can imagine kosher. It might take a few leniencies to get it kosher, but at least it's kosher. So that's a certain approach. It's not a wrong approach. It, it helps many people keep kosher, but it might not want we, what your approach has to be. And especially not what your approach has to be on Pesach. So that's, that's the general concept behind that. All right. So thank you for everybody that joined. Everybody, of course, is has a different pace off story and different things they're doing or not doing, what's going on. Um, but what we are going to do tonight is talk first very briefly, just in general, the whole overarching spirituality of Pesach, which I think we probably know, but we'll just remind ourselves. And then what I'd like to do is go through the Seder. There are 15 steps. 
and show step by step what's the spiritual intent. There is a spiritual intent to every single one of those ritualized steps. And if you know it, it makes the Seder much more meaningful. It's not like how long, how short, what are we doing? Why are we doing? Let's get the meal. Let's get this over with. No, there's a lot going on. And I want to, I want to, I want, I want it. I want to be part of it. So that is the idea. So 3,334 years ago, Pesach, our people were liberated from Egyptian bondage. I say our people, but of course we've learned enough times that our people actually means us. Because according to the Arizal, we are all reincarnations of that generation. So every single one of us were there. We've forgotten. Maybe we have some residual memory. <laughs> Maybe we don't have any, but we were there. Now, just again, a brief little history lesson to understand what was going on. We, the Jewish people, were in Egypt for 210 years, of which 116 was slavery and 86 the last 86 of those 116 was incredibly, incredibly oppressive slavery, horrific slavery. And this was actually Hashem's kindness to us. Because originally, according to the script, we, the Jewish people, were supposed to be in Egypt for 400 years of backbreaking labor. And through various strategies, Hashem managed to whittle that down to 210, of which he whittled down the slavery to 116, of which he whittled down the harshness to 86. So it was softer than it should have been, but it's, it still was a lot. And we got out, and we got out for the purpose of receiving the Torah as a free people, as God's people. And that's what happened then, and that's what's happening now. Well, Babacharev explains that there's a concept that our sages say, actually, coming from Megillus Esther, so we can remember Purim as we clean for Pesach. If you still have some Purim junk in your cabinets, you still remember Purim as you clean for Pesach. So in the Megillah, it says, and these days shall be remembered and done. We understand the remembered part. What does it mean, the done? So the sages explain that when you remember them, you're spiritually reenacting them. So what are we reenacting when we remember Pesach? Well, bottom line, a lot of things, but what's probably most important to us is Hashem's divine benevolence. I Meaning Pesach was a time of miracles. We didn't really deserve what happened, and what happened was ultra mega huge, and we didn't really deserve it that much. I mean, we had some merits, but there was a lot of other stuff going on. So it was really pure chesed, pure benevolence, pure compassion on Hashem's part that created the miracles of Pesach. So when I remember that, I'm evoking it. That's what I want. Just pure benevolence. I don't need to deserve it. Pure compassion. Just let it shine. Let those miracles shine. Our sages actually say that Nisan, this month, is the most auspicious time for Mashiach for this reason. Because Nisan, actually the word itself, Nisan means miracles. Nisan means miracles. Nisan means undeserved kindness. So there's this huge kindness that we've worked very hard for, but in the end is still bigger than what we deserve called Mashiach. And that's why Nisan is the most auspicious time for it to happen. So Pesach, when we call it Zman Cheiruseinu, the festival of our liberation, we're celebrating a historic event, a 3,300 plus historic event. And we're celebrating today. And our sages teach that in every generation, and actually the Alter Rebbe says on every day, we have to view ourselves that we were today liberated from Egypt, from our own Egypt, from our own personal Egypt. And we all have our own Egypt that we need liberation from. Some of us have many layers of Egypt. So you can say, wait, I went out yesterday. I went out a week ago. I went out a month ago. I went out last year. What am I going out again for? But freedom requires constant watch, constant guarding. Each day there's a new environment. Each day has its own Egypt. Each day has a power to undermine our freedom. Sometimes the biggest threat to our freedom is, is from within. Uh, maybe our complacency our belief that I'm not one to reach such spiritual heights. 
or any other self-limiting belief. Pesach is the ongoing process. It's a process and it's an ongoing process of self-liberation. We have here in this holiday, the struggle that's constantly renewed within each one of us to create freedom, to live out our spiritual potential. And that's why we have to remember Pesach every day. We have to remember liberation every day. Every day we need to personally leave my Egypt, my limits, my temptations, my obstructions that blocks our road to, to, to our own spiritual journey. Bottom line, I'm talking about the liberation of my soul from the constraints of the physical environment. When, and when this is achieved with God's help and I'm able to serve, I'm able to immerse myself in the Torah and mitzvahs that help me find spiritual freedom, it's removing a tremendous spiritual anguish. The tremendous spiritual inner conflict between what is physical and what is godly? What can I transcend? What can I utilize? And when I do this, I achieve freedom, real freedom. Real freedom in here means the freedom of serenity, the freedom of harmony, which is, of course, a prelude to the freedom and peace in the entire world with the redemption, with the ultimate redemption with Mashiach. So that's in brief what this whole journey is about. Now, what we discussed last week is all the work that we're doing now and whatever your work is, if it's shopping, if it's cleaning, if it's koshering, if it's cooking, if it's packing, whatever it is, there's a lot of work we can do during this time. And I took on something I have to say, I looked at the three ideas and I said, okay, I got to step up to the plate. And I decided I was going for a family resolution because I felt that's good for my kids and good for the energy of the family. And we took one on and we're, I'm at least very focused on it. So that was last week. Now we're actually talking about Pesach itself. Pesach itself, what is happening and how do you actualize it? And what I wanted to speak about tonight, and I don't know if we're going to finish it, we probably won't, but there's always next week, is the Seder. Because, of course, we know that the Seder, a lot is supposed to happen. So I wanted to talk about the Seder. I'm going to go through the 15 steps. I'm going to go through them briefly. But I want to give everyone just sort of a little, like, hook what to think about, what intention to have as we're doing the rituals, what's supposed to be going on in my mind and heart. And everything is ritualized. This is probably, perhaps, the most ritualized thing we have in Judaism. It might be the most ritualized thing in Western civilization. <laughs> We'll start with the Seder plate. You probably never noticed, but there are exactly 10 items. We have the three matzahs, three. We have the plate itself. That leads me to four. And we have six items on the plate, right? We have two triangles of six items, three and one and six, 10. There's a reason. That reflects the structure of our soul, of the 10 powers of our soul, our human conscious. And that reflects the 10 dimensions of God, the 10 tools with which God creates and sustains our world and through which he channels his blessings. That's what we're trying to access. Pesach is a time of blessings. Pesach is a time of miracles. Pesach is a time of freedom. So we want to open ourselves up to elicit that from God, to free ourselves, to free our families, to access all those blessings and miracles. So through God's energy of that 10, he's helping us free ourselves from our limitations. Now, the key tool we have is the matzah. And we did mention matzah last week. I'm gonna give a plug today. I'm gonna give a plug later tonight, but matzah is key. We are literally doing a very physical act. We're eating. We're going to speak a little later about food and being free or, or the slave to food, but hopefully we'll get to that tonight. But we're, let's, let's not go too deep. Matzah means we're eating emuna. We're eating faith. The second night of the Savior, we're eating health. 
the whole Pesach, we're eating belief in God. We're eating godliness. We're eating humility. It's simple. It's just flour and water. Like our simple, selfless bond with God. It's the key to my freedom. It's the key to my humility. So matzah is central to the Seder. It's the only part of the Seder that's still a biblical commandment. It's central to Pesach. And I'm putting in a plug now. I'm going to put in a plug later. I personally eat matzah every single day of Pesach. I'm proud to say I never eat bread during the year. I have this benching phobia. <laughs> you know, like, oh, that takes way too long. Which, of course, is ridiculous. But whatever. But Pesach, I eat matzah every single day. I have an opportunity to eat godliness. I have an opportunity to eat belief in God. I have an opportunity to ingest humility, and I'm not going to go for it. So the whole Pesach is very experiential, and matzah is that ultimate point. When we're looking at the Pesach, we're looking at the Seder, we're looking at everything. We have to, we have to realize it's a present tense situation. Every one of us craves freedom or should crave freedom if we recognize that we potentially are slaves. Maybe we're slaves to our inhibitions, to our fears, to our habits, to our prejudices. Maybe, possibly, probably, <laughs> for me at least, we have layers of ego that prevent us from expressing our true inner self, reaching our real spiritual potential. Maybe my soul is imprisoned in selfishness, in laziness, in indifference. Pesach in English we call Passover. There's a reason for that. Pesach, we have the ability to pass over all obstacles to reach that inner freedom. So when you read the Haggadah, and we're not going to talk that much about Haggadah because probably you all know much more about Haggadah than anything else. But when we read the Haggadah, read it in the present tense. Whenever it says Egypt, switch that for the word limitation. Whenever it says Paro, Pharaoh, switch that for the word ego. So when you read the line, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Make this a present tense story. We are slaves to our egos, stuck in our limitations. We're slaves. We're enslaved to ego. We're stuck. We're stuck in our Egypt. We're stuck in our limitations. So how do we get free? Eat matzah. <laughs> Suspend your ego. Matzah is flat, tasteless, egoless bread. A lot of times we're, we're scared to suspend our ego. We don't want to lose ourselves. Pesach, eat the matzah, suspend the ego, and we want to find ourselves. We want to find our true self. And this is, as I said, the Seder is a very ritualized affair. There are 15 steps. Each one is significant. Each one is an act that opens up an energy in a certain direction. So what we're going to do now is go through the 15 steps briefly. There are 15 of them, but just so when you're sitting by that say there, you will have, you'll remember something about each step and you'll be able to access the energy of each one of those steps. So the first step, of course, is Kaddish, right? We make Kiddish. What does the word Kaddish mean? It actually means two things. Kaddish means separation, and Kaddish means sanctification. And that's, this is almost like the central message of the whole Seder and the whole holiday. Separation and then sanctification. One, two, separation and then sanctification. So once you set yourself free from everything that imprisons you, once you separate, then, and only then, you can sanctify it. Spiritual freedom is attained by separating from and then sanctifying the physical, using it as an expression of a higher purpose. So the slave sitting at the say there says, I'm satisfied with my life. I'm not going to change. And the free the person who's focused on freedom says, I'm going to explore whatever I never experienced. I can change. That's the first message of Seder. I can change. That's Kaddish. 
I can separate, I can sanctify, I can change. The second step is orchat. Well, orchat, we wash our hands. We know that, we wash our hands, not on the matzah, but on that wet vegetable. Washing hands symbolizes purification. Why do I want to purify my hands? Because my hands are the most basic way I interact with my environment. We're always touching, we're always feeling, we're always doing something with our hands. I mean, also with our feet and our eyes, but our hands is like what's really getting into the environment around us. But the hands are not independent players. The hands are expressing, like good Jews always talk with their hands, the hands are expressing how our minds and our hearts are interacting with everything around us. But very often, the problem is, that my mind and heart isn't in sync. So the interface with the environment gets a little distorted. So I'm pouring on my hands water. Water always symbolizes wisdom, God's wisdom. I'm pouring the water to cleanse the hands, to remove the impurities, to remove all that that's blocking the purity of my emotions, the purity of my intellect to shape my interaction in this world in a more godly way. That my mind- friend, What do you mean? What do you mean by that? We're, what I mean we're is what, which part? The whole thing or just this last no, part like, about we're using, No, we're using our, we're, our heart things, one thing, but we're using our hands differently. What often happens is our mind and heart are not in sync, which means we are reactionary instead of mindful in terms of our environment. Meaning like a very simple example that's relevant probably to our crowd. Your kid does something and you start screaming <laughs> or you feel really tense inside or your husband does something and you give him a look. Now, if you were mindful, if your mind and heart were talking to each other, you wouldn't do that. You know, that's wrong, that's inappropriate, that's no point, that's denigrating, that's only gonna make my husband or child smaller that's only going to model for my children how they should not behave. So when I'm reacting, I'm letting my heart loose and I'm not allowing my mind and heart to talk. So I'm doing things mindfully. I don't mean what I mean mindfully without emotion, but what I mean mindfully is that my mind is regulating and processing and allowing the appropriate emotions. Like sometimes we emote things. What does that mean we emote things? It means we let our mind do its own thing and we're just heart, 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 reacting, reacting, reacting to all this stuff. And then like if we can sometimes process, you know, we call it put it in perspective. What does put it in perspective mean? It means I reigned in my mind. I said, wait, wait, mind, come back, come back, come back from Never Another Land. Let's think this over. Oh. And I actually shrink the issue, shrink my emotions, and then I can respond mindfully. So that's what I meant. And I'm glad you asked the question because it probably wasn't very clear. So we have a mind and our mind knows. And we have a heart and the heart feels. And there's the neck in between. It's actually interesting. Hasidah says, the back of the neck in Hebrew is called oref, which is the same letters as the word paro. So just as it says that paro wouldn't let the Jews out of Egypt, the neck, neck, oref, paro, is what blocks us from leaving our Egypt because the neck separates the mind from the heart. My mind knows. My mind gets it all. The problem is my mind and heart aren't communicating. I let my heart be the king and my mind is, I don't know where. I remember long time saying to you this concept that there's three quasi rulers in a person, their mind, their heart, and their liver. The mind is the thoughts, the heart is the emotion, and the liver is where the blood is sitting. It's the most bodily expression. Um, so very often, by default, we allow our heart to be the king. When it's heart, and then mind, and then liver, it spells out, this will work best for people that can follow the Hebrew, to the word lemach, lev, melech, kaved. Lemach, a lemach means a fool. Sometimes it's even worse. Sometimes the body is the ruler. 
Then you have the liver and then the heart and then the mind. Klum, kaved, lev, moch. Klum means a zero, a zilch, a nothing. And what we're striving for is mind over heart over body. Moch, lev, kaved, melech, the king. So when we're washing our hands, water again symbolizes Torah, life, God's intellect, God's wisdom. We're beseeching that the water should purify the hands, that there should be an integration of our mind and our heart and how we, our hands, how we integrate our environment. So the slave sitting at the say there says, no, nah, I, I let my instincts guide me. I like to be reactionary. And the free person says, I want to be mindful. I want my mind and heart to talk to each other. So is, let me ask you a question. You can just uh, raise your virtual hand. Is being mindful and not reactive a challenge? If it is, you can raise your hand. You hit reactions and you'll see that nice little hand there. Is it a challenge to be mindful and not reactive for your mind and heart to talk to each other? For me, it depends on the topic. Absolutely. It totally depends on the topic. Like Dorit said, when emotions get in the way, emotions get in the way in some topics. So our trick, what we call our triggers, that's, that's the word we usually use for it nowadays. When we're in that space of our triggers, it's very, very hard for the mind to be the king. And when it's not really something that bothers us so much, then we're, we're cool. We're, 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 we're thinking humans and we know how to rein in and control the emotions. If it's hard or if, as we're saying, in those areas where it's hard, keep this in mind as you do the ritual of orchats, as you're washing your hands and ask Hashem to help that these waters should cleanse. Step three. Step three is carpas. Carpas is the vegetable in the salt water, the onion, the boiled potato. When we're eating that, especially if you eat an onion, the most traditional way to do it, <laughs> it's tasting, sorry, I'll take away my hand if that's, if that's distracting, but I, um, I, I definitely, yes, I agree. There's many places where I can be so mindful and then there are places where I lose it. <laughs> so I, I want to have this in mind when I do orchats as well. Carpas. You might dip a little potato. Again, the most traditional way is a piece of raw onion, which doesn't, there's no problem dipping the potato. But I'm just giving you the raw onion to understand the symbolism. The raw onion in the salt water. It's sharp. The potato's a little bland. It's sharp. It's for us to taste humility, for us to remember the tears, for us to remember the labor in Egypt. Now, again, we said Egypt is a happening situation. So it's to help us liberate ourselves by remembering humility, by remembering that I have a choice in humility. What's my choice? My choice is I can choose to make myself humble to humble myself before God. And I have so many opportunities to humble myself before God. And if I don't, like in Egypt, the world's gonna humble me in a much harsher way as I am enslaved to it. Now, how, do, how are we in the 21st century slaves? I'm not saying this is true for everyone because everyone might have a very unique slavery, a very unique bondage. But the most common across the board enslavement, at least in America in the 21st century, is the enslavement to materialism. Now, the truth is our sages, whenever they speak about exile and the impression and the enslavement of exile, they always reference materialism. Running after the dollar, it might've been a ruble. But whatever it was, that was the slavery. So that is the most generic slavery. But again, you might say that doesn't enslave me at all. I've got other things that enslave me. But following that generic theme, the slave sitting at the Seder is a slave. 
He's enslaved to his or her work, to his or her money, possessions, I was saying at the beginning, um, before a lot of people got on, uh, talking about what's happening nowadays where who knows how many hundreds of thousands of Jews left everything from the Ukraine and maybe they have nothing to go back to. Maybe their houses were bombed and their, their, their work no longer exists and won't exist in the foreseeable future. You know, so I don't know, since then, every once in a while I look around my house and I think of not having anything. So we are, even if we think we're not, we are perhaps enslaved. Again, the goal isn't for God to take it all away from us at all. God wants us to have good lives and he wants us to have comfortable lives and he wants us to have the best. He wants us to have the best, but the best as free people. We can be enslaved to other things. We can be enslaved to selfishness. We can be enslaved to many things. So what is free then? A free person sitting at the Seder as they're eating their lunching on their onion or their potato, say, God, I want to be nullified to you. I don't want to be a slave to materialism or a slave to my selfishness or a slave to my appearance. I want to be nullified to you because something in this world is going to humble me. And I want that humility to come from my relationship with you. Do I work? Of course, I have to work as a tool to appreciate higher things of life not as a pharaoh that's subjugating me. So that's the message of the Karpas, the humility, the choice to be enslaved, humble to God, or to by default be humble to anything else in this world. And that can bring you to real humility, but in a very harsh way. I'm confused. Sure. Um, so I... Maybe it's just because it's more familiar to me when you say that matzah is removing our ego. And, and so there I think about the, the lack of ego and humility. I'm not connecting to, or I'm just not understanding the connection with the karpas and how we taste the humility from whatever that vegetable is. Would you please help the, me? The, car, the idea behind it is, now again, what you're saying, Elise, is correct. All the themes that we're going to discuss are going to keep repeating themselves because we have a few basic themes and our sages created many different roads to Rome, many different techniques to experience the road to freedom, to experience the humility. So you are right. And, and I said that, and I, I don't mind repeating it. The most central to everything is eating the matzah. But every one of the steps of the Seder is also bringing us to that freedom, which means part of the process of freedom is humility. We need humility. We need to leave our Pharaoh. We need to leave our ego to attain freedom. So that's why several steps of the Seder, including Karpas, including in a different way, Yachatz, are to attain that humility. So how does, how does Karpas connect to humility? The, the tears, the sharpness of the onion. I said, it's allowed a potato, but I said, envision an onion because you're going to get the theme better. Oh, that's very beautiful. Someone just passed on something to me that I never heard before. The matzah works on the mind and the wine on the heart. That's a very beautiful thought. Um, I think the matzah works not more than on the mind, the matzah actually works to free the soul. But there is the connection of the matzah to the mind. It's true, as it's as brought down in the Haggadah. And I never heard that about the wine and the heart, but that's a beautiful idea. Thank you for sharing. But I'm going to go back to Elise's question. So envision the salt water as the tears. And the onion as something a little sharp, a little bitter. So I'm munching on sharpness and tears. Why? The lesson our sages are putting in this experience, everything in the Seder is designed in the smartest way that modern teaching tools are just understanding. We don't want to say it. We want to experience it. So what I'm supposed to experience, but I have to be mindful to know what I'm experiencing. So as I'm eating that bitter onion with tears, with salt water, it's like something brought our ancestors to this space of bitterness of tears. It was backbreaking enslavement. It was harsh work, it was harsh labor. 
right? Like harpa symbolizes all that. I mean, all these little drushas that you probably told as children or I've heard children say, you know, many, many things embedded here. I'm just sort of going to the essence point. Okay, that was 3,334 years ago. No, that's today. The Seder is about today. So what's my backbreaking work? Where's my tears? Where's my sharpness? Well, you have a choice. You could be a slave or you could be free. If you're a slave, there's going to be something in this world that you are enslaved to. It could be money. It could be your appearance. It could be your social status. It could be other people's opinions of you. It could be anything. I said the most common one that our sages look at is the dollar or the ruble or the shekel as the, the, the primary overlord that most of us are enslaved to. But there are other versions of slavery. So someone just asked a question. I just want to finish this release and then I'm going to ask that question. So that's my choice. And I could choose to be enslaved to my appearance. I can choose to be enslaved to my house and how it looks and its, and its appearance. I can choose to be enslaved to my children's successes. I could be, choose to be enslaved to my bank account. Or I could choose to be enslaved to God. There, any slavery I choose, there's going to be the bite of slavery. There's going to be the, the tears. There's going to be the... the the, the bitterness, the sharpness, anything in this world God could use as a tool to bring me to humility. In other words, when the Jews were in Egypt for 210 years and enslaved for 116 and brutally enslaved for 86, it's not that God was checked out. It's not that God didn't love us. Our sages say that was the Kor Habarza. That was the smelting pit to refine away all the impurities to allow us to be free people and serve God and remove any trace and residue of any of the past impurities, like the fact that we stem from Tarach and our roots, roots, roots are idolatrous. We get past all of that in the smelting fires of Egypt. So if you want, you can be enslaved to your body, you can be enslaved to, to your bank account, and God will put harsh things there that will perhaps lead you to the tears and the bitterness and bring you to some humility but we don't have to go that road. We can be free. What does free mean? So I don't have to be humble? You do have to be humble. But you could choose to be humble to God. And you say, that's going to be the, the bite, if that's a bite, to lose my ego, to lose my Pharaoh. I want to be free about it. I don't want to be under. I want to transcend. I want to be enslaved and humbled by and to Hashem. And that's the Karpas. So two people ask questions. While I was answering that question. Um, so let me let me respond to those questions before we go on. So a lot of the questions are similar theme. And I'm glad people are asking questions. It means you're actually processing and taking ownership instead of just saying that's nice and moving on. <laughs> so I appreciate the questions. Keep them coming. How do you know if you're enslaved or passionate? What's the line? I think the line always is, who's the master? Am I the master or not? So if you're passionate about your cooking, that could be a beautiful tool to serve God and to help your family and to make healthy meals and eye appealing meals and get all your kids to enjoy eating and make Shabbos and Yantif so special. So you have a lot of passion. You'll have a lot of joy being in the kitchen. It's beautiful. Use it. Use it to, for your family's benefit. Use it for God. When you're enslaved to it, it means you're doing it in a way that makes no sense. It's gripping you. So even though you really don't have time and it's really stressing you out and there's no need for that extra side dish, but you have to do it and you do it anyway, you're a slave. Your kid is pulling at you. Your kid needs you. No, 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 no. I got to make another cake. You already have a dessert. Uh, just one dessert? I'd be so embarrassed. Embarrassed from who? Embarrassed from myself. You're a slave. Your child needs you and you need to make another dessert or you need to make any dessert? You're a slave. So I think that's in everything. I'm just, I just gave that as an easy example because as I've said before, this is not one of my slaveries. Um, of like, Am I using this as a tool or am I controlled by it? I think for many, many people, uh, internet, media, I don't know for most of us, I don't think it's TV. It might be our, our phones. It might be social, you know, 
you know, your kid's talking to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm listening to my WhatsApp. I'm just watching this. My, you've been doing that for the last 15 minutes. I know. I just have to finish it. You're a slave. That doesn't make any sense. You could stop. I can. I'm almost over. I'm almost over. You're a slave. So again, we have to be honest with ourselves and say, is this a passion that I use? Or is this something that grips me, that takes me over, that I do irrationally? Then I'm the slave. Um, now, it doesn't mean, of course, when we're talking about slaves versus free, for example, that, oh, I have a beautiful home. I guess that means I'm enslaved to physicality and possessions. Not at all. God wants us to have beauty. God wants every Jew to be rich. God wants every Jew to know the rich. God wants every Jew to have a very beautiful life, for sure. We, this is not like Catholicism. You know? This is Judaism. We believe in using the physical as a means to create the spiritual. So am I a slave or not? Same question. What's ruling? Do I prioritize buying and purchasing and maintaining over people and religious experiences and feelings? Are my children uh, have to be so, so careful in my home because my home is more important than my kids and they're enjoying things? Then I'm a slave. I'm a slave to my house. If my home is beautiful and functional and to my children friendly, use it as a tool of serving Hashem. Let people come in and see a beautiful home and be inspired that this beauty is all part of living a godly life. So it's not, uh, well, if you have this item in your home, you're a slave. If you don't have this item, you're free. That's not it at all. It's a perspective on it. Is this a tool to serve Hashem? I remember many, many, many years ago, we were doing something in our home. I don't remember what. And my husband said to the children who are now in their late 20s and 30s, and we're young, so it's that long ago. Whatever we were doing, I don't remember. Let's say we're painting. You know why we're painting? We're painting because machine's coming. And this house is going to your shalayim. And this house is going to be so beautiful then, and we're really making it beautiful now. I, I don't give myself credit. My husband said it. But I still remember it now. And he wasn't talking to me. He was talking to the kids. Because to me, it was such a beautiful message. I'm like, yeah. Now, you could give lip service to that and not, not mean it at all, or you can mean it, that you're using the physical world to serve Hashem. Are you a slave then? You're a slave to Hashem. A um, few more questions on this. Can you be a slave to another person? Absolutely. Absolutely. Of course. The same way any of these other things are true, there are people that enslave us or want to enslave us, or sometimes we allow ourselves to be enslaved by fears, intimidations, manipulation. Again, it's the same thing. Am I gonna be a slave to God or a slave to anything else? Okay, thank you for the questions. I so appreciate the interaction and knowing people are thinking and really trying to take ownership of these ideas. Step four, again, we did Kadesh, separation, sanctification. Again, separation from the physical and then sanctification of the physical. Same themes, using the physical as a service of God. Orchats, washing the hands, removing the impurities, giving us the wisdom that our mind and heart are integrated. Karpas, tasting that sharpness, tasting those tears, understanding I have to be humble, but I have a choice to be humble to the world, to be humble to God. For real freedom, I'm choosing God. Fourth, fourth step, sort of similar. We break the middle matzah, right? The whole year round, Shabbos, the holiday, we have two unbroken whole loaves. Pesach on the Seder, we start off with three because we break the middle matzah, but we still have the top and the bottom one to be the whole loaves when we eventually eat our bread, eat our matzah a bit later in the Seder. But we break the middle matzah. There's so many symbolisms, by the way, in all of this. If your husband or your children or your guests or your brother-in-law has some other great one that has no relationship to this, they're right, and this is right. Everything has many, many myriads of meanings. But following along our theme, breaking the middle matzah is expressing that God made a world where there's a lot of things that seem broken. And we can say, God, why are you doing that? You are perfect. You are complete. Why would you create brokenness? 
And one of the reasons, and there's many reasons, that's obviously not an original or simple question. One of the reasons is because something whole contains only its own measure. Something broken is open. It can contain the infinity. Matzah is a poor man's bread, we're told. Of course, it's actually fabulously expensive. <laughs> but it started off as poor man's bread, just flour and water. Low, broken. And when you're in that low, broken state, you can open up your soul and escape your Egypt. In other words, when you feel whole and complete and a done package, there's no room to grow. When you realize you're fragmented, you need others to complete you. Within yourself, things are missing and need to be completed. Then you can grow. There's a Hasidic aphorism. There's nothing as whole as a broken heart. So when it's broken, when it's open, then there's room. So the slave sitting at the Seder says, I know who I am. I know what I've achieved. I'm at this point in my life. I'm at this age. I'm done. And the free man sitting at the Seder says, I've only started to grow. H have you had an experience, seemingly a breaking, crushing experience, that was really a catalyst for that holding the infinite, for that positive growth, for that realizing you're not done and jumping way past where you were. You don't have to share it, but has someone had such an experience? A, a hard experience, a breaking experience, but one that you really, 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 really see helped you open up and get something much bigger than you had before. A few of us, I think more than a few of us. Sometimes it's hard to remember on the spot. Sometimes it's hard to find reactions on your phone or your screen, but um, that's, the, that's, to, that's what you should be thinking about when you break the middle matzah or when your husband breaks the middle matzah. That's, that's the message in it. And then we come to step five, which is of course the longest step of the say there, Magid, telling the story. I, I'm not going to share any details of the story. Actually, first I did, and then I deleted it from my notes because I'm like, we all know the stories. And, and if I start, I would never finish. I just want to go, I really, really want everyone to know what the Seder is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the comments someone just sent me. Um, the main thing I want you to remember, the main message of Magi, which is the message of everything we're saying tonight, is everything in Egypt parallels something in our lives. This is supposed to be something I'm living. And I want to examine my lives through this guise of ancient Egypt and understand it's all talking to me and about me. So the slave again says, I'm free. I live in 21st century America. What could be whoever has been freer than us? And the free Jew at the table says, I'm free only when my soul is free. That's the message. I'm free only when my soul is free. Sorry, someone just sent uh, something. Okay, so someone asked, which I missed before. Someone got lost in, in the in the in the comments in the chat. So I, I want to there, thank you for all the chats that are coming in. I really appreciate it and I really feel this means people are really, really trying to take ownership of these ideas, which is so beautiful. So I guess we reached the point of people recognizing they, they do have some slaveries. And then how do you break free from any slavery? So the the theme of the Seder, the see the theme of Pesach is. This is what I was actually trying to say about the Karpas. Every one of us is be enslaved to something. When we choose to be enslaved to Hashem, 
When our slavery is to God, he lifts us up over the other stuff. When the Jews left Egypt, we say they left us free men. Actually, that's not really true. They left a slave, but a slave to Hashem. Maybe that doesn't sound right. Maybe the way I'm expressing it is, isn't going to resonate. But that, that was the theme of Karpas. And that's really, in a sense, what we're saying here about the breaking of the middle matzah. And then, when we're searching for freedom, of course, if I realize I'm enslaved to food, yuck, I don't want to be a slave to food. I don't want to be a slave to my addictions, to alcohol, to caffeine, to drugs, to cigarettes. I don't want to be a slave to my boss. I don't want to be a slave to my bank account. I don't want to be a slave to my husband. I don't want to be a slave to my kids. None of us want to be slaves. So the first step is recognizing the slavery, which is what people were asking me for and I tried to give examples of to sort of understand when it's slavery. Once you've reached that point of saying, no, I think this is slavery, you set yourself free in the blink of an eye by a conscious choice to bring Hashem in and to say, Hashem, I need your help. Until now, I've been a slave to food. I want to be a slave to you. I want you to be the master. Not my cigarettes, not my coffee, not my, must be five o'clock somewhere in the world drink. Not my unhealthy relationships, not my figure, not my bank account, not my fears of what people are thinking about me. I want you to be my master. And I'm consciously turning to you. And this is the message of the Seder. I'm turning to you in a way that I'm nullifying myself. What does it mean nullifying myself? Nullifying myself means giving Hashem what you didn't give him until now because you were resistant and said, no, until here, God, I'll give you this part of me because I like doing that. And that sort of resonates and that feels good. But I'm not doing that. That does not resonate. That does not feel good. And I'm sure everyone here possibly has pieces they've never been willing to give to God. Um, just a, a simple example, I know a big challenge for a lot of women is, is covering their hair properly or in general modest dress. For some women, it's, it's, it's uh, and men, it's gossip. I'm giving some like classical examples, not cliches and not stereotypes, but just things that people can look at and say, oh yeah, I haven't ever given God that one. You can fill in the blanks of your own. So when you're doing that, that's an act of abnegation, of humility, of saying, God, you are the ruler. And yes, I serve you so well, but honestly, all those things I enjoy doing. I love to learn. I learn loads. I love to daven. I daven loads. I love to give charity. I give charity loads. So everyone around can look at me and think I'm such a great servant of God, but I know I'm not. I might be a great child of God because a child and a parent are in sync so you and I love the same things I'm your child and I love what you love but those little pieces that don't resonate I haven't given you I haven't been willing to be your slave I've only been willing to be your child now of course being a child of God is a great thing but to free ourselves of the other slaveries we need to accept God as the master. So when you do so, and when you say in a very conscious way on the night of Pesach, and we're going to explain why soon or not, we will probably continue this next week. We will definitely continue this next week. We're only up to step five. Um, Pesach, as we're going to explain, I'm just going to say this now briefly. We'll say it later at length, but just in case you missed next week's class, I want you to understand this point. Much later in the Seder, we're only up to step five, we open up the door, right? We, we actually mentioned this last week, opening up the door for Elio Hanavi, who comes. Our sages say everything God tells us to do, he does as well. Pesach is the night when Hashem opens up all the doors. And that's why freedom is so accessible. Because all of the doors between us and Hashem are wide open. So at the Seder, on Pesach, and we will discuss at the end that this, of course, continues the whole Pesach as well. But we're talking about the Seder. It's a very intense time. When you make that resolution and you're saying, Hashem, I want freedom, which means I need my soul to be free, which means I need to be your slave, which means I need to give you something 
I've held back because I wasn't going to give that to you. I do loads of things for you that I enjoy doing, but I wasn't going to give that to you because I'm your child, but I'm not yet your slave. Hashem, I want to be your slave tonight. And you open up the door to Hashem by committing to do very, very firmly that act that you're only doing because you're Hashem's slave. All the doors are open. Hashem takes it and showers back his response. And you're saying, Hashem, I want to be your slave. I don't want to be enslaved to anything in us. Help free me from those other slave rooms. And as I hold on to that, when the other slaveries come crashing on me, I'm like, no, I'm God's slave because I'm doing X because I'm covering my hair, which I'm only doing because he wants. I don't want because I'm his slave. I'm only being careful in this aspect of kosher. I'm only eating, drinking only chov yisrael, whatever it is. I'm only doing this, God, because it's your will, because it's not my will, but it's your will. And I'm your slave. I'm not anybody else's slave. I'm not anything else's slave. And I know it's Pesach. I know all your doors are open. I know you're responding. I know I'm initiating and you're sending back far more. So I know you're going to free me from all my other bondages. And when it seems I might slip into the bondage, I'm just going to squeeze harder to that mitzvah, to that hidr, to that act that expresses my slavery to God and to nothing else. And I know Hashem is going to respond and free me from the other things. Okay, so we are over time. So we're going to stop here. We just sort of got through the fifth section. I was going to ask if people have favorite parts of the Haggadah for them to share with us. But I won't because we're over time. Yudi, do you have something you're going to share from the Haggadah? Because you just raised your hand. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you do, that's fine. That's fine. Um, Mrs. I Turin. do have a question. Oh, oh. yeah, sure. Go ahead, go ahead. What's your question, Yudi? I just never like, I never totally understand the whole concept of being Hashem's slave. Like, I always feel like we're supposed to have like a, a love for one another and like, you know, like, like want to do it. Like there's, there's some mitzvahs that I just don't want to, like, I just, I don't connect to it. And then like, and I feel like if I take them upon myself, then I'm just going to have like, I'm not going to be happy with that. Do you know what I mean? I totally know what you mean. So That's just what we were talking about, that, like two minutes right, ago. But is that wrong? Like for your, like, like, a, I don't know. So there's two aspects to our relate. I sort of said it, but I didn't really answer your specific question. Um, um, there's two aspects to our relationship to Hashem. We have, can I give an example? Sure. Okay. So like fully covering the legs, right? That's something like I never took upon myself, but when I go to a shul where, where that's like their, their like min hug or whatever, then I do, right. I'll put on stockings, but like the second I come home, I rip them off. They're so uncomfortable for me. Um, I like, I just, I feel like that's the wrong message for my kids or in general. I don't know. So I totally get your question. And a lot of people have that question. And the answer is that, sorry, he did not get put in bed. Well, he, whatever, long story with Beryl Tent. We're not gonna talk about it. Um, <laughs> the answer is there are two aspects to our relationship with Hashem. And our sages call them, this isn't my, my, my concepts, Every one of us is Hashem's child. Actually, we're told every one of us is Hashem's only child. Actually, the Baal Shem Tov says everyone is Hashem's only child born in his old age. And every one of us is Hashem's Evid. If slave has the wrong connotations, think of it in the Hebrew. It's a little more innocuous. Hashem's Evid. Avadai Hain, God says. You are my Avadim. My servants, if that works better. What's the difference between being a child and being an Evid? So as you did said, being Hashem's child reflects the love in my relationship. Being Hashem's evid reflects the nullification. Which do I need? I need both. Every part of Judaism that I love, that resonates, that I feel good about, that I'm so proud of, that I talk to my children about with such passion, all those are aspects of me as Hashem's child. Why is that me as Hashem's child? Because... Children and parents should be in sync. 
it makes sense if your parents love something you do too you i mean you're a piece of them every jew is a piece of hashem so hashem loves shabbos and i love shabbos hashem loves sneez and i love sneez hashem loves tyra and i love tyra that's me as hashem's child but every single one of us guaranteed is going to have at least one if not many 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 parts of judaism that don't resonate that we might not like not just passive we really don't like they grate on us they irritate us they annoy us they stifle us great this is the beautiful opportunity you've been waiting for to be hashem's evid not expressing your love i mean of course it is an expression of your love on a deeper level but to keep it simple expressing your nullification because when I love Shabbos and I do Shabbos, that doesn't express really my nullification. You would say, of course it does. I wouldn't do this if he didn't command it. I understand that. But if you love Shabbos and you, I love Shabbos. Oh my gosh. I wait for Shabbos all week long. And oh my gosh, I got to wait another seven days. That was going on. I love Shabbos. So of course I wouldn't dream up these laws on my own. Of course I'm doing them because Hashem said, but it's primarily me as Hashem's child. We're thinking the same way. We love the same thing. But if you don't enjoy and really don't like and actually are annoyed by covering your legs, that's not you as Hashem's child because Hashem loves it. So you and him are not in sync on this. So why am I doing it? Because now you have an opportunity to be as Evan. And we're actually told that being the Evan is more powerful than being the child. Again, it's like the idea of the broken matzah. It's nullification. If I love, I'm giving you me. But if I'm nullified, it's not me. It's much, much bigger than me. It's like the broken matzah. It's what I was trying to explain about the broken matzah. It's infinite. It's, it's, it's not limited by my space. It's, it's his space. So when I'm sometimes in a situation where I have to do something I really don't want to do, and I have those situations, I say, okay, Hashem, I'm your Evan. Sometimes I think of it like I'm your soldier. I'm just following orders. I'm your Evan. This has nothing to do with me. I don't want to do this at all. This is 100 plus percent you. I'm so grateful I have an opportunity to be your Evan. So answering the question that was asked, how do we free ourselves of our enslavements to all the stuff of this world? When you have Hashem as your master, he's going to take you out of everything else because he doesn't want you to be enslaved to other things plus him. So if you're consciously choosing Hashem by doing what you are only doing because it's his will, because it's not your will, he's going to get you out of the other things, especially when you think all this by the say there. Dina, do you have a question? I do. You mentioned before about the about eating matzah that I think you said it was the Arisa, mm -hmm. that it so I, I noticed that I remember, I think that there was like some things in the Haggadah that was like in bold. Was that also, do you like to say, mat, um, shoot, I know there's like three words you say. Um, Pesach, matzah, mar. Pesach, mat, yes. Yes, exactly. yes. That, that also, is considered something everyone must say, at least those words. Yes. Okay. So, okay, but we, but, but we wouldn't, I mean, it, it's, it's obligatory. I don't know. To use the word arisa, I don't know, but it's obligatory. It's obligatory at least to say Pesach Matzah Mar. That's what we have to say, and then of course talk about it for hours. Okay. But when we talk about which of the original mitzvahs that were performed by the Jews in the times of the Beis Hamikdash are still the arisa, of which the three are Pesach Matzah Mar, the only one left that's still the arisa is Matzah. Mar is today rabbinic. Because maror from the Torah biblically is connected to the carbon Pesach. That doesn't mean you're not supposed to do it. It doesn't mean it's an option. You have to do it. But it's rabbinic. Matzah is the same mitzvah as what's written in the Torah. And Pesach is the zecher, which we have the chicken neck or shank bone on our Seder plate. And we have the final matzah of the Afi Kaiman. That's how we eat the matzah. That's how we eat the carbon Pesach, as we're going to discuss when we get to that next week. Um, so someone just asked me, because they would like to find out everything about the Seder, because they really want to have a real Seder this year. They've been doing it for many years, but they want it to be real this time. 
can we do this earlier? Is Wednesday night going to be too late? Um, I'm, I'm trying to think myself. I, I actually, well, the, the, the night that I, I mean, I, the night that I could do it earlier would be, I could do it Sunday night at 8.30. That night I could do it because um, the other two nights are only available later. So that'd probably be too late. But Sunday night would be available at 8.30. So um, maybe I'll put this on the chat and people could respond. I'll put it in our group um, who could make it Sunday night at 8.30, which might be easier for people than Wednesday night, which you might be in the thick of doing a lot of other things for Pesach. Um, let me know. And again, maybe it's not going to be good Sunday night at 30 and you'd rather stick to the original time. But if it does work, I, I, I could do that then. That, that, that would work. Someone just sent me a beautiful. That's so beautiful. I'm going to share this. Someone just posted for me, which would be for everyone, that the numerical value. How does that work? That doesn't work. Uh, I don't get that. Oh, the misbar cotton. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. The misbar cotton. Misbar cotton means you take the numerical value of a word and then you add the integers. So the, that's what Torah calls misbar cotton, adding the integers. So the misbar cotton of Eved, Eved means that Evan, we said that 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 we can hear that we're better maybe than slave or servant. Uh, Evan, if you add it up, is a numerical value of seventy six, of which the adding those integers you get to the number thirteen. Thirteen is the thirteen attributes of God's compassion. When we emulate, I'm reading this. This is very beautiful. It's not my idea. I don't know where this is from, but I'm reading it because it's beautiful. When we emulate those qualities from Hashem acting according to his will without ego and only as an Evan, then we're able to do this through Tyra. Now we, uh, now we go back to the original number. I get it. Evan, remember, really is 76. I in is 70, Bayes is two, and Dalit is four. So then we take the 70 aspects of Tyra, building, that's the base, with the Dalit, Dalit symbolizes humility. So we really, through Tyra, we can really access our own abdus, our own humility and subjugation to God, which opens up his absolute compassion. Very, very, very beautiful. I don't know who that's from. Meaning I read, I read a chat, so I, I don't know the source of it, but that's very beautiful. Okay, we are going to end at this point. I'm yeah. going to put on this idea of Sunday night, 830. And if that works, then we will do that. Thank you so much for participating. I know everyone's quite busy and I really felt people were very invested and we all want a very, very meaningful say there. Everyone should have Three one. Class. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Superb. Thank you, thank you as always. Thank, thank you. you, Mrs. Join. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you so much.